Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Doing good? Okay, you made it through the, uh, the spring snow. That's good. I woke up this morning and my flakes were like this big. I'm like, oh, no, but we were fine. Yeah, Got, had coffee and everything's good. Why don't we stand together and worship the Lord? His grace is enough, that means you're enough, right? Welcome to Christ the King. Great to see you this morning. It's Palm Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week. If you uh, hit your email this morning, you saw some words that I sent you, which I'll be doing every day until uh, next Sunday, which is Easter. Thank you for not being afraid of the snow. Obviously, a lot of people were this morning. I'm glad you're here. 
A um, couple of things. I know that it may not look like it by how few people are starting off today, but this place is going to be packed next week. You have to have more chairs, take the tables out, get things ready for a big crowd. So, you know, scoot in, move up, park on the outside rims. That would be great. Good Friday service here is very simple, and uh, it, it's a contemplative time, a time to just come, sit back, take in some of the iconic things that take you where you need to be, be thankful, pray. It's a drop in and out. It's not a program, because none of this is about a program. This is about the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. So um, you can read more about that in your program. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for all of the opportunity we have in this day, and I ask that you would just come and break into our hearts so we could lose ourselves in you. In your name, amen. Amen.
He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so He is jealous. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great their affections are for me and oh how he loves us so and oh how he loves us how he loves us jealous for me he loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. We'll come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait and Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling will come Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And oh, what a Savior, isn't he?
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, um, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus promised that um, he would meet us right where we are at at all times. This morning, Lord God, we just, um, we stand before you, God, and we say, come fill me. Come change me. Um, come make me new. God, forgive me of my sins. Make me whole again. Lord, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. And before you're seated, um, why don't you say good morning to one another. Good morning. Uh, as you're finding your seat, you can open up your program, and we've got some notes in there for today's teaching. We're, uh, we just finished up a series in Romans uh, called Transforming Faith, and today we start a new series uh, called Weak Head, Strong Heart, which is, at first glance, as I looked at this, is kind of an awkward uh, title because my first thought is, wait a minute, so am I supposed to just kind of go by the heart? Because for someone like me, that's spelled a lot of trouble in my, in my life. When I don't think things through and I just go for whatever is going on in the gut, uh, sometimes I get in trouble. But I think we'll find out that actually what we're talking about is something completely different. Uh, it's different than shooting from the hip. There's a difference between that and uh, God leading us by the heart. So we're, uh, we're studying uh, this uh, series out of the book of 2 Corinthians. And the reason I'm confused about whether it's 2 Corinthians is because there's a whole crazy story about Paul and his letters to the church in Corinth. We're going to be talking about what does it really look like for us to rely on God in our walk with him. Corinth is a fascinating place. Uh, I guess the best way to imagine it is if the only way to get from San Francisco to New York was a little strip of land four miles wide, and right smack in the middle of it was Las Vegas. In Greece, you have the southern portion, that's the Peripenes, that is uh, isolated from the rest of Greece by a little strip of land four miles wide. And right in the middle of it was a city called Corinth. Corinth uh, was a place where to go north and south, you had to go through there by land. All the commerce in the Mediterranean that wanted to go east to west around Greece actually ended up going over that strip of land. Because there was a, there's a cape, the Malaya Cape, at the bottom of that isthmus um, that is one of the most dangerous 
uh, bodies of water to get around. So if you were going to sail around that cape, uh, the Corinthian sailors had uh, little sayings like, if you're going to sail around the Cape of Malaya, you better write your will first. Or if you're going to sail around the Cape of Malaya, uh, you might as well forget what your house looks like. It was a dangerous place to pass, and so the smaller ships would actually pull up to that little strip of land, and they would portage their boats, put them on rollers, and roll them the four miles across that little strip before they would sail around the Cape. The larger ships would just stop there, unload their gear, and travel it across, and then load it onto another ship. So you can imagine that Corinth became this place of massive commerce. I mean, there was so much trade, so many goods coming through there from every place imaginable in the whole world. So there was every kind of person, every kind of product, everything was going on in Corinth. The other thing that started to happen in Corinth is it became kind of a hotbed. You know, wherever, uh, wherever sailors are, no offense if you've been in the Navy, but then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you just end up with all kinds of diversions. Anything you could imagine to entertain yourself, to have any kind of luxury, to have any kind of uh, naughtiness, I guess the better word is debauchery, um, that was going on in Corinth. So much so that for, for years and years afterwards, even in theater, when a Corinthian would be characterized in a play, it was always a drunkard. It was always some sort of womanizing drunk guy that would play the Corinthian. The place just went crazy. It was such an important city that when the Romans came in and took over Greece, they leveled the city, but it just came back up again. Because it was too crucial, too important, too strategic a place that it just sprung back up again and lived up even more to its reputation of just being a wild and diverse place. So when, against all odds, a small little church in the time of Paul after Jesus sprang up in Corinth, you can imagine that it was somewhat of an eclectic group of people. At one point, Paul gives a whole list of the things that are just unacceptable in the life of a Christ follower. And he lays out all these things, drunkenness, debauchery, um, sleeping around, all the immoral acts. And he says, because you were all once these things. And he's not just saying that metaphorically. They were literally all that stuff. The people in Corinth, when they came into relationship with God, they were coming out of a life. So Paul wrote several letters to the church in Corinth, and and we know this because if he makes references, we've got two of them, and there's a solid chance that parts from a couple more have kind of been put in the middle of them. If you can imagine, uh, years after Paul writes these letters, people kind of discovering scraps and bits of pieces, and different people have different portions of papyrus, and they're trying to put it together. So we know from what he says that there's probably about four actual letters First and second Corinthians in our Bible are basically the second and fourth letters. Some of Paul's writing to Corinth was corrective. He was chastising them. The one that probably comes before Second Corinthians was one that most scholars refer to as the severe letter. Whenever someone realizes that my name is actually Christopher instead of Chip, I just laugh because um, don't call me Christopher unless you're uh, holding my ear and leading me by it. <laughs> that's the only time I've ever heard that name, Christopher Brian Johnson, and that's when uh, I know I'm, I'm getting it. Paul wrote a letter to Corinth that was called Severe. He was just kind of laying into them for some of the stuff that he'd heard that was going on. And the hard thing about a letter is it's kind of like listening to, to someone who's talking on the telephone. Because you can't hear the response, you can't hear the dialogue that's going on, you can just hear what the one person is saying. And so Paul wrote these things to the church in Corinth, the churches in Philippi and Ephesus, all over, uh, and they're actual letters. His goal wasn't to write scripture, it wasn't even actually to have a broader scope than that church, although at some point he says, pass these around so other people can read it, which they did because writing was scarce. But this is an actual letter from Paul to the church in Corinth. And the one just before this letter was a severe one where he just called them out on a lot of the stuff that's happened. 
they were backstabbing each other. They were um, kind of making a mockery of, of, of communion and the, the Lord's Supper. They were just beginning to kind of drift back into where they came from and infusing that into their worship and their life as Christians. And so he just laid into them. And then he started to wonder if maybe he'd been a little too harsh. And so he kind of started stressing out about it, and he, and he was on his way and was going to come and see them to talk about it. And he intersected with, with Titus, who gave him some good news that the letter actually just hit home. And they came around, and they started making some changes. So 2 Corinthians is the next letter he writes, where they're kind of in a good spot. And, uh, and so he talks to them a lot about, now what? Now how do you live, now that you've kind of taken this to heart? It expresses his relief that they had taken the severe letter and that they'd put an end to the fighting and backstabbing and debauchery in the church. And now that they've shown their desire to entrust themselves to God, Paul now challenges them to an even deeper level of spiritual maturity. We find in the book of Colossians that Paul kind of gives a good snapshot of what he's accomplishing here in 2 Corinthians. Colossians 2, 6 says, My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You are deeply rooted in him. You are well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School is out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Man, in, here in the Western church, we know all about what he's talking about here. We have so much scholarship in our country here, in, in, in the West in general, all written in our language originally, in English scholarship. You can find a gazillion books on whatever it is. You want to study 2 Corinthians? There's a ton of commentaries out there. There's a lot of them kind of like diets that'll say different things about different stuff. So you kind of have to wade through it. But there's anything you could want to know about the Bible. We have studied it. We have dissected it. We've put it up against the Greek and against Hebrew, and we've pulled it together. We know so much about context now through archaeology and other discoveries and other writings. We know all about the Bible. And yet, I wonder if this challenge from Paul stands for us too, that at some point you've got to stop studying and you have to apply what you've learned. You've got to just do it. The problem I think that we encounter is that we are so often kind of stuck in our head, spinning our wheels, trying to understand better and figure things out, become better people on our own, that we never cross that line into allowing God to lead us by the heart. Number one in your notes, if we get out of our heads and trust God to lead us by the heart, the world will think we are crazy or foolish or both. And just like scholarship, we understand this all too well as well, because we love a self-made man or woman. In fact, our definition of success in our culture here often comes down to someone that has pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, whatever those are. We've pulled ourselves up by them, and we've made our way. We've, we've accomplished something. I was listening to a radio interview this week, and they were talking to this guy who had started multiple Fortune 500 companies, and he told us that everything he did was based on something his dad had said, and that is, you'll never make good money working for someone else. And so he took that to heart, and he pulled it off, and he's made a ton of money, and he's the boss. In our culture, we look at that and we think, man, that guy has made it. He knows what he's doing and he's got everything he needs and he doesn't need anybody. Maybe a trophy wife so he can look a little better when he's at parties. But this guy is it. We love a self-made man. We believe that uh, asking for help is a sign of weakness. And we see this all the time in church. I'm guilty of this, where I will help anybody with anything they need, especially if it requires uh, heavy lifting more than thinking things through and doing math. But I will be there if you need something. But you know what happens when I have a great need? The last thing I want to do is reach out to someone for help. In fact, unless I absolutely can't get around it, then I'll have my wife ask somebody for help a sign of weakness. We want to be self-made. 
this letter is about letting God lead us by the heart when our heads either want to overthink or simply just take over, period. And what's difficult about that is we live in a culture that values living in your head or it values just let, shooting from the hip. Either way, God is not in charge. Starting his letter in 2 Corinthians, which we're looking at in this series, in verse 1, Paul says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth and to all of his holy people throughout Greece. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. In your notes on the second point, I wrote, uh, a sure sign of being stuck in your head is how you define comfort. Comfortable is the heated seats in my car, the, the all-wheel drive that got me out of my driveway down the hill and here on time this morning. Comfortable is a warm fire, a good movie, the dog kind of sitting next to me or on my lap money in the bank, and a full belly, preferably some kind of cake. <laughs> when I think of comfort, I think of the things that make me feel like I don't need anything more, except maybe a, a little more of what I've got. We talk about the comfortable life, and we describe it here as the American dream. It's the dream we all have of being able to be self-sufficient, like we just talked about. I could be the self-made man where I don't have to rely on anyone. I don't ever have to show that sign of weakness that is asking for help. This is not the comfort that Paul is talking about. In fact, it's kind of tragic that we've translated this word into it to be comfort because the truth is what, what Paul is talking about here when he says comfort and he says it over and over again in this passage is actually a lot closer to the dynamic that you see uh, between soldiers. You can imagine some soldiers in a foxhole and their enemy is overwhelming them and they rally together and they decide together that this is a good day to die and we're just going to rush the enemy, whatever happens. We've got movies and movies and stories and books through all contexts and all times of history that celebrate a few brave men rallying together and charging into the battle and coming out ahead, don't we? So many of my favorites. I love that story. I love the idea of a group of people coming together and uh, Vin Diesel saying, I don't have friends, I have family. And then they race their cars and get the bad guys. I, I, can't, I never get tired of that story. When Paul says we comfort each other, the language he is using is what happens with those soldiers when they get together and they say, it is, hey, what's the line? It is an honor to die with you today. That's the comfort that challenges them, that spurs them on to walk into the battle when the odds are against them. There's a bit of a gap between my sense of comfort and that sense of comfort, isn't there? If we're going to get in this place where we acknowledge our weak head and we embrace a strong heart that God is leading our definition of comfort has to fall into Paul's camp. That is a completely different experience. Paul's definition of comfort is this idea of rallying together because in isolation, we just drift and we slide and we make up our own reality one of my favorite stories from World War II is about a Japanese soldier named Hiro Onoda. He was in the Philippines uh, with, a, group of, with a, a unit of soldiers, Japanese soldiers, and his job was to spy on the American troops there in 1945. 
which we all know is when the war ended, when the Japanese surrendered, but they didn't get word of that. And so some of the unit disappeared. They ended up uh, surrendering. A lot of the guys, just the numbers dwindled and dwindled as they set up uh, clandestine camps all over the hillside so they can continue spying on the American troops that were hardly there anymore because the war was over. Slowly, everybody died off until it was just Hero, ironic name, in the mountains, running around, killing villagers, livestock, getting in little firefights with them, basically uh, doing small acts of terrorism and taking care of himself, dutifully following his orders as a soldier of Japan. It was 1974 before they got him to come out of the jungle. Can you imagine? All those years, following his duty, all by himself, carefully taking care of his uniform so that when his superiors returned, they would say, good job, and it would be clean, and he could come out. His sword was clean and sharp. Several times they would drop, uh, they, because he kept terrorizing everybody on the island, they would drop newspapers saying the war was over. Um, they brought his relatives out with bullhorns saying, please come out, the war is over. But he was so entrenched in this idea that Jap Japan could not lose this war that he assumed it was propaganda. He assumed that the Americans were forcing his, his relatives, that somehow they'd got them, kidnapped them, and brought them there just to draw him out, and he was not going to fail in his duties. He randomly met a college student in 1974, a kid who basically went around looking for things like Bigfoot, and he was there seeing if he could find this guy, and he finally talked him in to coming out of the jungle. When we are isolated... We are left to nothing but getting into our head and allowing our head to lead us. And before you know it, we spent 20 years in the jungle following some sense of duty that is completely irrelevant and so far from the reality that God offers us from the beginning. Verse 5. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. Did that just change <laughs> that passage of scripture for you? If comfort isn't being comfortable, if comfort isn't rest and luxury, and it's actually rallying together to run into battle together when the odds are against us, then all of a sudden, when he says God comforts us, and as he comforts us, we can comfort you, we can comfort each other, and then we can suffer well together. There's a completely different meaning. This changes everything. If you're thinking that God... Is, is around and that God saved you from your sin and promises eternity with him and that that promise is so that you can be good and comfortable and happy and get along with people, we're actually completely wrong. We couldn't be worse off. We couldn't be more misunderstanding of God's goal in setting apart and saving his people through all of history if we think it's to bring us comfort, the kind of comfort that makes us feel safe and secure and, and free from harm. The comfort that God is talking about is, is to rally together. It's a comfort in the face of danger. Jesus never meant to start a religion his great work on the cross had nothing to do with paving the way for the American dream. In reality, Jesus did nothing short but start a revolution. He established a new order where his people, Jews and now Gentiles, were made right with God so they could change the world. Jesus started a revolution where his set-apart people could carry on a, a, a spiritual battle and warfare on this earth 
requiring the kind of comfort where we can rally and just storm into danger, not knowing the outcome. Every Sunday morning, we come here and we sing the songs that prepare us, that give us this kind of comfort for the battle. I'm listening to the words as we're singing, and I often marvel at church because where else do a group of people get together and sing out loud? Maybe in the car. But we get together and we sing every Sunday morning. What is that for except to seek God's comfort, to reflect worship to Him with the understanding that He will comfort us and we can comfort each other to continue to fly in the face of danger? to give us our place in the revolution that Jesus started. We are revolutionaries as we fight to bring freedom from the shame and the lies of a very real enemy. Amen. Amen. And here's the big part. Revolution is not easy. And revolution always costs the lives of the people in it. The people that benefit from a revolution are not the people fighting it. They're usually not around by the time the world has changed. In your notes, the third point is the more difficult the revolution becomes, the more God comforts us, the more God comforts us, the more we can comfort each other. This revolution is worth fighting, believe me. This revolution will cost you everything, and if you're not signed on for that, get out now. Stop wasting your Sunday morning. In order to stay in this fight, we have to bring the rallying comfort to each other and spur each other on. We cannot be driven by our heads. We must surrender our farts. Our farts. <laughs> oh, man. God bless YouTube. Surrender <laughs> your hearts. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> what? What's that? That's right, you are listening. I'll take a laugh if I can't get an amen. <laughs> Paul says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. And we're not exactly sure what Paul's referring to here, but uh, there's a likelihood that he's referring to a moment in Ephesus where some silversmiths got upset because so many people were accepting Jesus as their Savior that they weren't buying all of the shrines and the idols for the, for the other gods in Ephesus. And so they rallied people together and started a literal riot that spread across the entire city of Ephesus. They grabbed some of Paul's partners in ministry and had them in an amphitheater, and they were screaming, and, and there was so much ruckus going on. It says that people were there that had no idea why they were there, but they were mad, and they wanted Paul, and they wanted to kill him. They wanted to try him or kill him. At one point, somebody tried to speak and quiet the crowd down, and uh, it says that they started to scream and cry and cry out loud and, and for another two hours. It sounds like a European football match. In any case, it was a dangerous situation, and even if that's not what he's talking about, Paul tells him, this is where we thought we were going to die. We assumed we were going to die. The truth is that the world will fight every step of the way to keep its status quo. The system of, of shame and lies and greed and false love flies in the face of the gospel. And if you live this out to any degree, it will get ugly. Later in 2 Corinthians, Paul describes what he's experienced. He says, five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes because 40 was supposed to kill a man. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. Paul continued this relentless pursuit of his mission because he realized a foundational truth about Jesus' revolution. Continuing on in chapter 1, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God, who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks, because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. Number four, the more difficult the revolution becomes, the less we can rely on ourselves. This revolution, this fight, this mission is worthwhile because the whole world is enslaved to shame, to lies, to pursuit of false love, all of the things that capture us and hold us and ultimately kill us. But we can only continue to fight. We can only continue to rally in this revolution if we stop relying on ourselves and have total confidence in God and what he's seeking to accomplish. Just imagine the cause of Christ that is backed by the power of God to raise the dead, financing a revolution. We can say with confidence in verse 12 and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially toward you. Our letters have been straightforward and there is nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. I hope someday you will fully understand us, even if you don't understand us now. And then on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way we are proud of you. When I read this, I, I think of my days as a youth pastor, working with students, especially middle schoolers. <sighs> Man, you pour in and you invest and you look at the blank stares because everyone is terrified of saying something dumb like give over your farts to God. <laughs> and they just stare at you and you keep pouring your heart out and you mix in some fun so you can try to keep attention and you drill them over and over and over with the love of God and then they graduate from high school and you don't know what happened for 20 years. And then, then Krista, who said, there are no good Christian guys out there. And I said, what about Thomas? And she said, ew. <laughs> to see them now married with two kids, and Thomas is a good man, a good father, and a good husband. And I knew Krista would be all those things. Ben Bishop, who I should have connected to Krista, as he's saying, no girl is ever going to love me. I'm ugly, and no one's going to want to be around me. And now to see him, to, to go back and visit him as he's a, a published author, a novelist with his wife, making a life together. John Huckins, who was a student, an intern, a director with me, who is now pouring his life out, advocating for the poor and the oppressed. I could go on and on and on about these kids who, I, with a group of amazing adults, poured our lives into with no apparent results for 20 years. Why would you do that if it wasn't because you could give yourself over to what God is doing 
pour your life into it and just trust that he's doing his thing. I'm going to skip forward a little bit to verse 21. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. He has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. God has enabled us, commissioned us, and identified us as his own. Over and over again, Paul talks about the authority we've been given. Jesus talked about the authority he was bestowing on us to be a part of his revolution. When the disciples were with Jesus and he said, I'm going to go into Jerusalem, and they knew what was waiting for him there, even if they didn't know the story about crucifixion, they all decided at that point, and they looked at each other and they said, well, we might as well go and die with him. The assumption when they went into Jerusalem today was that they were all going to be killed. They, of course, thought it was going to be a battle and a political move. But nonetheless, they were ready to go. They rallied. They comforted each other. God has enabled us to be a part of this revolution. He's commissioned us. If you are entering into relationship with God to be a follower of Christ, you are commissioned for this revolution. There is no innocent bystander. There is no conscientious objector. You are the revolution when we enter into this. And Jesus' revolution is about a new kingdom. Now, not later. A place where people are enabled commissioned and identified as God's very own children, having authority to advance this kingdom. And just like the disciples were shocked to find out, this is not about dominating the world. This is not about taking the power from someone else so we can have it and use, abuse it just as badly. This is about bringing life to a world that is lost in its slavery to shame and lies and fake love. It's a revolution worthy of its cost, which will be nothing less than your life. Let me pray with you guys, and then hang out for a second, because we have a little short video. Father, I don't actually like language of revolution. I have a great uh, honor and respect for soldiers and people of action, but I'm actually not much of one. I prefer my definition of comfort. I'd rather give it the office and be done. But I can not deny the truth that Jesus started a revolution that has nothing to do with me feeling safe and flush and like I don't need anyone. Father, usher us into this revolution of embracing the strong heart that is led by you that will cost us everything and will require that we rally together as soldiers in a foxhole running to our sure deaths, only to discover that you, with the power to raise the dead, have and will continue to rescue us. Advance your kingdom through us, Father. Bring your gospel, your good news, your love to the world around us, and let us be a part of freeing them. Amen. When you're scared to invite someone to church this Easter, you procrastinate. When you procrastinate, you worry that it might be too late. When you worry that it might be too late, you resort to desperate measures. When you resort to desperate measures, 
you end up on the six o'clock news and become ostracized by your entire community. When you become ostracized by your entire community, you're forced to relocate to Possum Neck, Mississippi and change your name to Skeeter. Don't relocate to Possum Neck, Mississippi and change your name to Skeeter. Invite someone to church this Easter. See all you Skeeters later. Have a good week. <laughs>